So hello, bonjour, thank you for coming to digest with us after your lunch. My name is Christoph. I'm still a French, half German and a farmer. I used to be a kids broadcaster and I'm very happy to welcome you together with uh, Amandine Cassie, who is the head of internal research of Eurodata, Nina Hahn, who is the um, SVP, EVP, SVP, SVP. <laughs> yeah, she should be SVP, but she's EVP of um, the international development based in London for Nickelodeon. Um, Bob Higgins, who is the EVP here, sorry darling, <laughs> <laughs> also from Fremantle uh, in uh, Kids, and Nigel Picard, who is the CEO of Zodiac Kids UK, so a lot of letters. Um, we'll start first with uh, 15 minutes research re results from fantastic Amandine from Eurodata, <laughs> and then we'll continue. Merci beaucoup, Amandine. Thank you very much for being here, Amandine. Thank you. Thank Encouragement. You. <laughs> she woke up at four o'clock in the morning for you. <laughs> so, me again. Good, morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, if you've been uh, here uh, this morning, you know that we are Eurodata TV and that we're covering all over the world and we can provide you with uh, any ratings of any program uh, when you want, at any time you want. Um, and if you've been here uh, also this morning, you know that uh, TV is doing well with children, with everybody in general, but especially with children. And uh, in North America, uh, United States pushing, uh, is pushing viewing times with uh, an extra five minutes more compared to, uh, to 2010 and the uh, children spent uh, almost three hours and 40 minutes each day uh, in front of their TV screen. In the main European countries, uh, the, TV, the daily viewing times of children uh, increased by nine minutes in four years. And in Asia, it's also, they are also big consumer, for, uh, especially for youth, uh, youth programming. Nevertheless, if we are looking at what uh, kids are watching, uh, it maybe will be a surprise for some of you, but uh, they are not watching only uh, kids' uh, programming. And they are mainly watch uh, family shows, really family shows. So they are obviously influenced by their parents' viewings a bit, and they follow a national preference for variety shows, uh, game shows, uh, sports events, and so on. So game shows uh, are the, the essence of family programming. For instance, in uh, France, uh, the children tune in uh, especially for The Price is Right or uh, Wheel of Fortune uh, in primetime uh, game shows. In Germany, Vetendas uh, uh, was the third best performing program, all genre combined, with children. And uh, adventure game, uh, adventure uh, game shows such as uh, Survivor, uh, Amazing Race, or I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, are among the top shows in uh, in the UK, in France, in Canada, and in many other countries. Sport events also are very uh, very uh, uh, the, the reflect of uh, of uh, local culture, and uh, children are keen of uh, sport events. For instance, in, uh, in Spain, where football is a religion, um, Champions League, Spanish League, Spanish Cup, so international and uh, regional and local competition of football, uh, regularly uh, top uh, the rankings uh, with, uh, with children. Obviously, the Super Bowl in, uh, in the US, uh, hockey in Canada, or the Rugby, Rugby World Cup uh, in France. And among the best performing uh, shows with children, we have uh, many talent quest and musical shows. Um, a strong taste for music, uh, singing and dancing that we can find in, uh, in live action shows also. Uh, so uh, for instance, uh, Eurovision Song Contest, not the kids one, but uh, the, the normal one, the standard one, uh, gather a share of more than 70% uh, with children in Germany or uh, Idols, Britain's Got Talent, or Got Talent, the format, or The Voice, uh, mesmerized uh, children all over the world, especially in Europe. And in South Africa, Jika Magica, the format, local uh, format uh, for music, is also uh, a hit with a strong share of almost uh, 60% and uh, more than one million children uh, on average for the, for the show. So it's not, 
uh, coincidence if we have a kids version of many of these shows, such as uh, The Voice Kids, Pequenos Rigentes in, uh, in the US, or uh, you've, got a, uh, you've Got to Be Kidding Me, uh, which is uh, new, I think, for the, for the MIP uh, TV. Moving on to fiction programming, uh, obviously children uh, do love uh, movies, especially animated uh, feature films, such as Madagascar, Ice Age, or uh, Shrek, which are still the best performing and the most recurrent titles uh, in the top, uh, top rankings. But they also live, uh, uh, love live action uh, franchises, such as Harry Potter, Pirates of the Caribbean, and, uh, and so on. As far as series are concerned, uh, they are almost influenced by their uh, siblings or by their parents because the best performing series uh, with children are often the same as their parents. Actually, uh, apart from the United States of the, where the um, top rankings is made up uh, almost 100% youth live action, in many other countries, this is this, this kind of series, just like House, the Big Bang Theory, or Grey's Anatomy, that uh, gathers the largest uh, audience with children. For instance, in, uh, in the UK, Doctor Who gathers more than uh, almost 60% uh, of share with, uh, with children. And uh, live action series are often an uh, intermediary step between uh, youth programming childhood youth programming and uh, series, drama series and comedy made for uh, an older audience. So if we look what children watched in uh, 2007, uh, in Germany and in the US, the top one was High School Musical 2. Four years later, the children became teens and now the, uh, the top one is a local series uh, in Indenburg. Sorry for my accent, but you, you're used, used to it now. <laughs> uh, so, in der Burg in uh, Germany, a series set during the Second World War, and Glee in the US on Fox. So, we see that uh, how important it is to secure uh, the loyalty of uh, younger view, uh, the youngest viewers from the youngest age to, to be able to move from strategic youth programming to other strategic slots on uh, the same channel or sister channel. So we have seen uh, this morning that when we focused on kids programming, animated clearly dominate the top rankings. However, live action is uh, increasingly challenging uh, animation especially in the, in the US. And globally, on a panel of 13 uh, territories, live action represents uh, almost one quarter of uh, top, uh, top rankings. If we look at uh, three uh, representative top three uh, in different continents, we can see that uh, mainly uh, American, uh, American series from Disney and Nickelodeon are on, uh, are on the top, but also local, uh, local uh, series. So youth programming, youth live action, is often the prerogative of uh, youth dedicated channels. And when generalist broadcasters uh, offer uh, youth program, live youth programming, live action, uh, it's usually domestic ones. So we can see, for instance, that in South Africa, Soul Buddies, is uh, the number one, and it, it is a domestic, uh, domestic uh, channel, uh, show, sorry. Um, so, just uh, like as I said, uh, Nickelodeon and Disney flagship show are the most recurrent title uh, worldwide. With uh, some music team series, uh, the, still very appreciated uh, by, uh, by children, so a uh, taste for music that's echoing with Talent Quest, uh, Talent Quest show, uh, such as Victorious, for instance, uh, which is in the best performing uh, programs in Canada, US, but also in Spain and, uh, and Denmark. Uh, Light-hearted series, American series, also resonates with an uh, international audience, just like iCarly or uh, Suit Life on Deck and Suit Life of uh, Zach, Zach and Cody, which are quite recurrent in, uh, in uh, top rankings. 
And one of the biggest challenge for, for broadcasters today is to keep the whole family in front of the same screen at the same time. And live action is a good mean for that, as illustrated by uh, Wizards of Waverly Place. We, and we see that uh, here on ITV1, for instance, one third of the audience is made of uh, children, 4 to 15, and another third of adults, 45 and, and more. So the whole family are watching, uh, watch uh, live action programming. But some titles uh, manage to stand out uh, of the US crowd. Uh, for instance, the Australians uh, just add water or dance academy, which are in, uh, in the top ranking in uh, both in, uh, in their um, country of origin, but also in, uh, in Europe. Part CGI, part animation, part live action, uh, Lazy Tone is still a huge hit, uh, both in uh, Asia, for instance in South Korea, or in Europe, uh, for, uh, in, uh, in Spain or United Kingdom. And one of the most emblematic uh, show, uh, uh, local show be becoming global is Patito Feo, which, uh, uh, which uh, was a hit in Latin America, but also in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, and uh, still uh, boosting uh, um, channel share in, uh, in many countries, especially in Italy, on the generalist uh, channel Italia Uno. And uh, some titles are also the local favorites uh, of children. So we have seen uh, Soul Buddies in South Africa. The British one also are very, uh, very popular. We know that British series globally uh, are good for beating uh, US series on, uh, on the domestic market. And live action is no exception. For instance, Tracy Baker uh, is uh, still boosting uh, CBBC's uh, share. Or the a spin-off of Doctor Who is also, so Sarah Jane Adventures, is also uh, a hit in, uh, in the UK. A very interesting title is Pangas, a Dutch one. So in the Netherlands, this is the number two with, uh, with uh, teens, uh, 13 to 19. It is the best performing live action series uh, with, uh, with teens and, uh, and uh, children. But what is very interesting about this show, this is that it's not only a live uh, action series, it's a full experience uh, provided to, to children with a very uh, comprehensive website with exclusive uh, content, some uh, in real life events, uh, books also, press uh, magazines, so full uh, and multi-platform uh, series. And I think this is the most visited website by teens in the, in the Netherlands. And uh, finally, to conclude, um, we know that adaptation of uh, scripted format is a trend on the rise for, for series. And one of example is Anubis. So this is also true for live, uh, youth live action. And uh, so in the, in the, the show was developed for the Dutch market on the Nickelodeon. The finished uh, version, Dutch version, uh, very well traveled and uh, boosted audience uh, in Sweden, for instance. The show was then adapted for uh, the German market and after that for the US market. So adapting uh, format is a way for scripted series, use or not, to have uh, global ambition, international ambition. It's a uh, able uh, series to reach uh, global uh, audiences, resonating with both local and uh, international audiences. That's all. And if you need more information, you know where to find us. <laughs> Merci, Amandine. Thank you very much. You did very well this afternoon, too. Yeah. <laughs> I think your data is really OK. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't ask for the prices, but I think, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't work for them yet. Um, <laughs> so, and sorry from Disney, they wanted to send someone, and somehow it didn't work out. But we have Nickelodeon here, and we just heard about Anubis. Uh, so Nina, working from London, developing further shows for the group. So what are the, the new things, the new priorities? 
Um, we're, still, we're still excited about the newness of Anubis, I have to say. <laughs> but, um, and as the slide pointed out, it was a really great experience to show how things can germinate outside of the US and when developed um, with the global remit in mind can uh, cycle out through a course of, in this case, Holland and then Germany and then Anglo-American. So it's been a, a great success story and hopefully there are gonna be another five of them to come. Um, you know, I think I brought a little reel, which maybe we can just start with because it's far more fun to watch something than to hear me talk. Um, just a little sizzle to give you, um, get you in the mood for Nickelodeon, which has three clips on it. I'm used to talking with the microphone. It's very hard. How do they do it? Um, one is the first. You hold it. Right, no, I can't. <laughs> I think I have to sing or something. Uh, the first clip is uh, Victorious, which um, I'm assuming everybody knows about. She's a fantastic gem in the Nickelodeon um, swag of, of programs, the Dan Schneider show, Dan Sh Schneider show um, who's the creator of, of iCarly. So we'll show you a clip of that. We're also going to show you a clip from the Big Time Rush movie. Big Time Rush is the series um, that um, you know about on the series side, but we've also now um, going to, you'll see for the first time, this little piece of movie footage, which is an homage to the Beatles. So um, it's a US show taking influence from a little known band from Britain. Um, and the last piece is a clip from How to Rock, which is a show that has premiered in the US and then will be premiering <laughs> around the rest of the world, uh, starring Symphonique Miller. Um, and it's a show about uh, a girl who is very popular at school and then all of a sudden, um, due to some unfortunate circumstances, becomes very unpopular. And the series is about her trajectory back into popularity. So it's very relevant uh, to kids today. So rather than hear me talk, Let's do roll this. tape. Give Tori a squeeze. Play that funky music, white girl. You know I'm half Latina. Then hit it, muchacha. Whoosh. My butt's gotta breathe. <laughs> That's hilarious. I can't let this fall into the wrong hands. We are the wrong hands. Let's, Let's do this. this. It's what we do. We can get out of this. Really? No. I'm not perfect. And you people are not my friends. Peace out, Girl Scout. These are my friends, and we are Gravity Five. And we know how to rock. If you love who you are, put your hands up. You a star, if you ain't on TV. You tall, you short, you different, you cute, you light, you dark, you beautiful, you, you, you. You're perfect the way you are. You can be you. I can be me. You can be you. I can be me. You can be you. I can be me. Wow. Wow, everybody. <laughs> well done. So Nina, is, is live action still on the rise for Nickelodeon? Definitely, definitely. I think it always has been a staple of the network and um, the other half of the, this morning's panel of animation is live action for us. And it's um, a huge, vibrant part of the business that has grown exponentially over the years to include not only the domestically driven and produced products, but things that um, germinate outside of the U.S. as well. So um, it is a daily, a daily remit for us. And in terms of like sources for it, because we had like uh, Holland, UK, America, any other places where you look at stuff happening? Yeah, I mean, we look everywhere. I mean, we're, we're lucky enough with, with 50 channels around the world to be able to shop in a lot of closets, our own closets. So we spend a lot of time working with the Latin American teams and their incredibly prolific um, production line of telenovelas and what works for them regionally, what can work for us globally. Um, and we work a lot with all the other key regions on what's being produced and what may um, be suitable to roll out um, and support globally. So North is a big, um, a big 
great source for us. Australia is a big, great source for us. And then outside of the Nickelodeon family of channels, um, clearly there is just the great production company, producer, vision person who has a great idea. So, Thank you. Yeah. So um, from a fantastic big network to an ind small independent producer, Fremantle Tiny, Bob. <laughs> So what's, what's new in live action for Fremantle Kids? Um, what's new in live action from Fremantle Kids? Well, I'm going to show you a clip of our newest show, um, or at least the most recent one to premiere called The Aquabat Super Show, uh, in one second. Um, as was pointed out in the presentation, um, I actually just wanted to make one little uh, correction to that. On My Baby is a Vampire, it is not a U.S. show. It is a Canadian show made for Teletoon um, that actually popped worldwide on Disney Channel, but, uh, but it is uh, a show that was made outside of the US system uh, that has really exploded uh, bigger than, than most um, that are typically made outside the US system. Northern um, American thanks and no part Canada. Uh, Canada you know, a huge part of that is Disney's machine getting behind it yeah. in a way that you know, quite often you don't see. Um, from some of the U.S. networks getting behind an independent, and they got behind that thing and just pushed it, mm -hmm. um, and it really popped. Um, so I just want to point that just out. Well just to, to check if, you, if you're following, but uh, it's, it's okay. She was checking <laughs> <laughs> in. And we'll tell to Disney that you've been kind to them, so they should still follow. I just want to give props <laughs> to the Canadians. Some money. <laughs> you know, we love them. <laughs> so um, Iceland, uh, Latin America, Canada is hot, and what else? Canada, uh, we, are, we are beginning... Uh, uh, production tomorrow uh, in the UK on a new show uh, with Russell T. Davies, uh, who uh, recreated Doctor Who and created Torchwood, um, a show called Wizards vs. Aliens, um, which will come on BBC, uh, CBBC uh, later this year. Um, we just announced yesterday, uh, I believe, uh, with Cartoon Network Europe, a show called Team Toon, which is a live action animation show. Uh, that we're making in uh, in New York with Larry Schwartz and on Nick Tunes in the U.S. Uh, and Australia, uh, we have another show with Larry called uh, Alien Dawn, uh, which is a single camera action boy action alien show, um, and uh, and that's what we have going in live action. So what do you show us now? So what I'm going to show you right now is the opening titles of the Aquabat Super Show. Uh, which is from the creators uh, of a show called Yo Gabba Gabba. Uh, it's about a, uh, a rock band, the Aquabats, uh, who are a real rock band based out of Southern California. And uh, they are also superheroes. So they, it's a rock and roll, action comedy, adventure, live action animated puppet, musical show. Another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Easy peasy. So and that's it. So let's roll that. Wow. <laughs> so who was crazy enough to want that? Uh, the Hub Network. The um, Hub Network. The Hub Network. Uh, Margaret Lesh there, who you know, just is a woman of great conviction and willing to take chances. She took a chance years ago on this show that everyone else rejected called Power Rangers. Um, and, uh, and we There's all a little bit of there. it in there. Uh, a, little, there's a little bit of everything in there. Yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a little bit of country, a little bit rock and roll. Um, but, uh, but she saw it, she loved it, um, they got behind it, 
Um, right, it's been on for four weeks. Um, the ratings uh, started, you know, kind of okay. Uh, but in four weeks, I think, you know, kind of hopefully from word of mouth, it's getting a lot of twittering and whatnot. It's gone up 253% um, in, in, in the four weeks. So it's just really spiking for them um, and doing extraordinarily well. Well done. Uh, there's 13, um, and uh, they announced that they're upfront that they're doing 13 more, but they haven't told us officially <laughs> yet that they announced <laughs> it. So. For so free, you got to give them for free. <laughs> that's why. Thank you very much. And so, Nigel, maybe you you are. I didn't bring you. No, I know. So you'll have to talk about it. Um, uh, so uh, I, I I look uh, I work at Zodiac, and uh, in the kids side, uh, we've always done a mixed genre portfolio. So live action and animation, uh, some of it preschool, including live action. Um, and I think what's changed for us in the last year is the appetite from the international marketplace for live action formats. I think we would have probably thought most of our live action formats, apart from where you might occasionally get a pre-sale or a co-production opportunity in drama, um, were, were for the domestic market. And I think what's exciting and what's happened uh, in the last year for us, and I think it's uh, apparent in, uh, for Fremantle and for other companies, is the appetite there is now internationally, especially out of the US, to look at formats that aren't necessarily in the traditional animation formats or even the comedy formats, but extending that to entertainment, uh, factual series or entertainment series. Uh, so we, um, our most recent one, and why I didn't bring a format is because I'm rather hoping everybody's seen it, uh, a tape, uh, was we uh, took a show that's been on air in France for 23 years uh, called Fort Boyard, which is shot uh, in uh, La Rochelle, which is based on a Napoleonic fort, and we made a kid's format of it. Now, we had looked at that before I was part of Zodiac, uh, when I was RDF. We had all looked at that show several times. It's been on in the UK as a primetime show. And it, for me, it's a sense of how, that, uh, of how the um, attitude to live action has changed, is to A, that we sold that to XD. XD uh, Disney XD in the US co-produced it with ITV which is probably the first time that marriage has happened. Um, it was a coming together at the right time. Uh, we turned the show around. It was pitched in MIP this time a year ago. We were shooting it uh, three months later. We delivered it six months later. Now, that's pretty remarkable in the history of co-production, in my view. It's usually two to three years. This was two to three months. Um, and the show has performed pretty well. And what's, as it's now started to ro roll out, it's performed very well, as it's started to roll out for XD around the world, We'll see how that does. So we know that ratings are very good in a lot of the uh, uh, European territories. And so I think that what's interesting about it is the start of, uh, or it's the acceleration of an opportunity that probably didn't exist a little while ago. For one who don't know it, it's a bit different because it's not uh, fiction. It's really like another challenge game it's a, Sorry, thing. it's a big yeah. challenge show. It's, uh, and it was an interesting that as we looked at the ratings is I think one of the challenges for us as kids producers is to realize the jeopardy and excitement that you do get in Celebrity Get Me Out of Here or Survivor or Fear Factor. And uh, we used to do a show called Scorpion Island, which was another co-production that uh, we co-produced, and Disney run that in quite a few territories, where now we've been able to at least give the appearance that kids are, uh, are taking genuine risks. And, uh, and we've been able to match some of the production values that the child audience would expect because they're watching so many of these uh, primetime shows. So Fort Bayard is a high action, big challenges, high wires and in a fort, yeah. And is it mostly uh, like um, format you, th you see where it's going, where then you have like an Anubis that is reshot in the different languages, we got the script adapted, and Fort Bayard is adapted, I guess, with other kids, you don't just dub it, uh, that's uh, usually moving forward? I, I think in the ideal world, uh, if you can do a wipeout for kids or a, um, where you can take a hub show, uh, create one central hub and then bring uh, contestants from around the world to it, that clearly is the most uh, mm. economic way for the broadcaster and it's obviously the best use of uh, building one set. Um, we, for, the, uh, for Fort Boyard, we had 50% uh, UK kids, 50% US kids. What we're looking at doing in the future is whether we bring kids from other nationalities uh, and shoot local version. It's still quite expensive, but it's not as expensive as starting up the, the, the whole thing from scratch. So yes, the hub, the hub route is the way to go. And for the big shows that like the, I mean, sorry, I'll 
Vizna is not here, but the, the Hannah Montana, after Hannah Montana shows the big iCarly, the, I mean, maybe your one is going to be huge. There's still also space to dub it and distribute it uh, worldwide. I mean, your channels are taking yeah. the UK, US, um, Anubis in other countries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, we do. I mean, there's obviously a, a smattering of both ways at it, um, personalizing within a region, producing it as a format, specifically for that region's needs, and um, dubbing as well. So whether they take the Anglo-American version or they, they dub it, it does go across those regions. You too? Similarly, you have like also hopes that they will travel just being um, dubbed. We right now all of our shows are we're it, it's the tape sales where they're traveling. Um, I if there was a broadcaster out there um, who said you know we'd love to do the German version of My Babysitter's a Vampire and we could you know make it work economically, yeah, we'd love to do that. Um, but right now the show, the original show, is doing a good enough job of traveling that uh, there's been no need. Yeah, I th I think there's no doubt about it live action shows, dub the dubbing cost and the M&E, yeah. it makes it more expensive than yeah. an animation show. Yeah. Uh, to find a route through, especially if you're doing a reality or a game show, mm -hmm. uh, the M&E tracks, the, the cost of dubbing, there are going to have to be some shortcuts that are taken to make that work, because otherwise it becomes economically non-viable. So that's, that's a challenge, I think, for still going forward, especially when you're shooting some of these bigger shows. Uh, dubbing, uh, a drama is usually done with an M&E, so hopefully it's an easy dub. But that's certainly a, something you have to look out for. It also, from a network perspective, it adds another layer of timing because it can premiere in the, in the language in which it was shot, in this case in English, and then when it's got to go to other languages, it is a lead time for all, all that dubbing to happen. So it can't always go out at once, day and date, which is often better for the show. Yeah. So I hope you're digesting well. Uh, we're a bit <laughs> more over half of it. If you have any questions to the panel, they all spoke and you know them now. Do not be too <laughs> shy. I tried to get the tweet feed, but we didn't get it. So you can't. You have to do it. Just putting the hands up and little mic coming to you if you have a question. Um, maybe on. Uh, so what changes now through all these successes that are come? I mean, we had the Anna Montana wave, and now you have new. Th you have formats. What change in the way you look at the financing of all of these when you're independent producers? I mean, do you see? Um, you, do you develop formats, even not trying to do it somewhere, and just try to see if the market is ready for it? Is, there also, is a format market existing for you, or...? I, th I think it probably happens two ways for us. Um, so one, what we tend to do is develop our own IP. We do work with third parties and we w with uh, other producers, but we tend not to be somebody that just partners on the basis of distribution. We're looking for genuine partnerships. I think all our development has to have an audience in mind and therefore a network in mind. We tend not to try and just do a catch-all for everybody. That's quite difficult. I, in this older uh, live-action uh, material, slightly different than the preschool market. Um, financing, without a doubt, is becoming harder and harder, uh, not just because of the recession, the problems that are happening in retail, everything's feeding through. Um, also, more and more, uh, sparing Nina's blushes and uh, and her colleague uh, <laughs> um, uh, US uh, channels, you now need really to drive a global brand, a global network, and uh, and that's put them in a very for, from a producer's point of view, that's put those people in a very strong position. Um, it's uh, it's appalling, and uh, so it's it's constantly a challenge of doing that. that. You can of course launch shows without going on a global network. Uh, you can do it territory by territory. But uh, if you look at all the big live action narrative shows, uh, Hannah Montana, iCarly, you look at all those shows, they've relied on a rollout. And, and as Bob was saying about uh, uh, Vampire, Vampire, you know, when you get a network behind a show, that's the most powerful partnership. I suspect as independent producers, we'd say, we wish that happened a bit more. Um, and it's not just the in-house show, but it's the, it's the show that is coming from an independent. But when that's working in harmony together, it's fantastically powerful and that solves a lot of the financial issues down the line yeah another thing that you know being an independent you know, the way that Nickelodeon and Disney uh, make their money is is from advertising and then from ancillary and whatnot but you guys can make up your money through your advertising we have to make it up on the sale uh, of the show and hopefully the ancillary so anything that we look at we really have to make sure that it is going to travel um, there are shows that you guys have put on you know, take a, a Drake and Josh or something, um, which I know did bang up business in the U.S. and the rest of the world, eh, 
did okay. You know, our things, we really have to think, you know, what's gonna work? So we, you know, as we develop, and you can tell by the shows that I've talked about, we go really high concept, um, because that will tend to travel better. My babysitter's a vampire. You know, we also go with what no one else is doing. We're not gonna try to out Nick Nick and out Disney Disney. Um, so we kind of go where they're not, and no one was in the single camera horror comedy where the vampires eat the kids. Um, no one was doing that, so, so we did that. Um, same thing with Aquabats, same thing with, with Wizards versus Aliens. Um, you know, the BBC, you know, are really, you know, swinging for the fences with it. It's totally different. It's, you know, Harry Potter meets Independence Day, and no one's doing that type of thing. So those are the, the projects that we're attracted to because we think they'll travel better. There's more opportunity for ancillary uh, than some of the other live action shows might have, and, um, and more opportunity for us to make back our, our investment. And so the model here seems to be like a, a national channel somewhere believing in something, going for it, and then the jackpot is when like a big <laughs> network worldwide then pushes it forward. I mean, Lazy Town, they did their way, and then all of now Cartoon Network bought it, and they're going to push it further. Anubis was an independent studio, Studio 100, and yeah. first in a country, and then... But it wasn't as arbitrary as that, and I think it's really important to understand that, you know, Eurodata spends every single day doing research. And from a network perspective, Nickelodeon is the same. We don't just kind of get on and say, well, that, you know, if it works in a few countries, great. If it works in the, in the US, great. If it doesn't work anywhere else, that's fine too. We spend an enormous amount of time corporately and on all levels researching every decision we make and why we make it, both from a macro level across what's happening in trends in kids and also show by show by show. No decision is made and very little development is done through the pre-production production process without checking in with the end user every single time. And that's why we're so particular about how we make stuff because what we think is great we show to kids and sometimes they think it's great and it's fantastic and sometimes they see it and they just it doesn't so resonate. So, so from the qualitative research, I mean, not se big secrets, but what does come that you think is really exciting in terms of live action for kids, in terms of age range, in terms of topics, in terms of how d narrative? Well, I, think, I mean, I think um, obviously age compression is a big, big uh, player at the table. And whatever it was 10 years ago, it's even more now. So we're, they're, they're just compressing and compressing and compressing, which is why you know, you're seeing nine-year-olds watching Kim Kardashian and whatnot, which is quite So you're saying frightening. getting younger and younger. Younger and it. watching older. So whether it's family viewing or it's compression or it's a storm and teacup of both, um, who knows. But well, obviously we want to speak to that. We want to speak to the fact that the way that we as adults all um, sort of put in bundles, the, the fact that they're getting it online or they're getting it on their, co on their phone or they're getting it on their television, to them, they just get it. Just give it to me, get it, and they don't even differentiate between how they're getting it. They just want it and they want it in you know four screens at once. Which is a very different way of viewing and it's a very different way of ingesting story, obviously, as well. Um, you know, for us, for us, family viewing is definitely a big piece of business for us to your... Is it better with live action? Is it is co-viewing easier with live action than with animation? Um, I think... It's I, I think uh, probably live action has more appeal to a shared viewing experience with parents. Yeah. That's and SpongeBob. And, and, <laughs> and I think certainly SpongeBob. the research says that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's true. But yeah. SpongeBob, you would, there are certainly, there you know, certain Simpsons classes. and SpongeBob, there are certain ones that do, but they are... Yeah. I think co-viewing is, and we certainly see it a lot in the U.S. We have Nick at Night, which is a brand where it is completely dedicated to family viewing, and everything on it is about family viewing, and it is enormously successful. But it is very conscious about what it puts on the air that will appeal to you know the sort of nine, ten, twelves, and yeah. thirty-year-olds. I mean, the BBC have had fantastic success with live action as a shared viewing experience, as well as just kids. I think. And Nina's absolutely right. The issue for all of us in the next five years is the compression, mm. is where we're seeing you know, that age coming down that is, that is uh, aligning themselves or using uh, specific targeted children's channels to watch. That's coming down. And that's going to be a challenge for us, I think, mm. uh, editorially, to keep that together. Yeah. And in terms of like regional influences, because we had the um, Asia and animation in the morning, we just had the telenovelas uh, from Latin America, I think, which had an influence on Anubis. Yep. Um, do, you see any, do you see anything else f apart from the typical American, I would say, sitcom uh, in the scripted area that, um, that's happening? Did you see any kind of other kind of... So you, you've been talking about the um, shows, the, the uh, family shows. No, do yeah, any, any other influences from elsewhere? 
Um, absolutely not really, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, the telenovelas, yes. I mean, they've, you know, and we're all trying to, we've all looked at that. I think there's expertise. The telenovelas are something special. Um, I think that for us, it's finding content that is just so exciting and is different. I think Bob's absolutely right. It's our issue is we've got to, as independent producers, we've really got to be supplying something that they're not doing in-house. Yeah. And that, that our uniqueness is going to come from something that is <coughs> new to them. And I think that's the challenge. And I think that uh, companies like ours and uh, like Fremantle are, are scaring the world, if you like. We are to those ideas coming through from producers. And I, I, I know you did preschool this morning, but certainly I've seen that m that's been far more apparent in the preschool market than it has in the live action older market, where we have seen ideas from all over the world that have now traveled and we're converting them to international shows. I think this, this uh, in the entertainment and drama, uh, well, comedy, more difficult to see those influences from elsewhere. Well, live action is for preschool anyway, also still something. I yeah. mean, uh, yeah. 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 Bananas yeah. in pyjama yeah. and this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, yes. we do some of those shows there. But, uh, Waverloo's into live action. Uh, Waverloo's are sort of mix. Uh, we're doing another show for CBBS now, which is all live action. Uh, that's slightly tougher. Yeah. I think it brings up a another interesting angle on all this, which is sometimes it's less about what's in front of the camera, i.e. the shows and the trends, but actually how the new models are going to work behind the camera. So there's a big learning curve in how, for example, the UK produces, how Germany produces, how the US produces, the structure behind the camera of who does what, who runs what, the cultural relevance of how you produce, the expectation of how you produce. And as these um, partnerships occur, it is, um, I think, one of the, um, it, it catches you behind your back. You don't know that, in fact, the US produces is a very different way than the UK, and how you match up while you're, co while you're partnering, how you match up those production expectations has a direct impact on what you get on screen. Um, was it your experience on Anubis? Definitely, I mean definitely on Anubis. It was huge. So what was the main big differences? <laughs> Well, I mean, you have so many differences. Some of them are creative and some of them are just work style. So we even had things, for example, when we would shoot a scene with two English boys sitting on a couch, they could sit next to each other and touch shoulders, and that was totally okay. In an American um, <laughs> setting, you can't no, do no. that. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a lot of this. And, you know, it, it was completely, if you didn't have, if you just had the British team on set, you'd end up with that. You'd end up with that on the air. You'd end up with that on the air on an American television show. And you'd end up with an American kids, boys, it's going, that's weird. I don't get that, right? So um, we had to be really careful to find the um, vantage point that didn't exclude one side or the other and reinvent a third angle in on what was global and yet didn't water it down. And I can't, I, you can't underestimate how much of that was spent across the language, across the scripting, and across how we worked in terms of story editors, showrunners, and what does that mean in one world and what does that mean in another? Because all of that stuff affects what you get on air. Yeah, it's certainly more sensitive in the live action than in animation. Yes, yeah. this question. <laughs> it is. Um, did we wake you up? <laughs> I don't see you because you're in, all in the yeah, dark. Exactly. So I you all look lovely. I don't know if you're sleeping you. or still there. I hear a few laughs, but that's the only thing. If you have questions, uh, before pitching your shows, and give you your cards and trying to get the <laughs> checks from them. Mm -hmm. um, Pitch to Nigel. If you want to have a <laughs> quick question. Ah, some light. Hello, the crowd. <laughs> No? You're very happy? Oh, yes, we have a lovely question from a German producer. Can you just say who you are? No, yeah, you'll take the mic. And <laughs> we, have to, we have to use the mic. You have to use the mic. Come on. I have a loud voice. Um, can you talk a little can bit you about... Can you just say who you are, darling? Yes, Marie from Puzzle Pictures. Hi. Um, I just moved the company from the US to Germany, so I'm actually experiencing a lot of the what does a producer do in Germany versus in the US. But um, can you talk a little bit about your acquisitions, um, the way that it works? Because in the U.S., you really go through all the agencies, whereas in, in Europe, you know, I call up the head of the, the network and they sort of just pick up the phone. Um, so I'm curious to hear where, how it works in the U.K. Um, when you look at new shows. So who are you talking, who are you talking to, yeah. to pitch, basically, I'm, right? This is going to be good for all of us, so yeah. we'll listen to this. Yeah. 
<laughs> I feel like I'm being tested here. Um, I won't speak necessarily from the UK. I'll slide out of this one. You ready? No, I won't speak necessarily from the UK because, in fact, from a Nickelodeon perspective, it isn't about just buying for the UK. Um, it is about buying for looking at everything that runs through the system and seeing what is the best course of action for this property. Um, is it is it is it something that we want first choice and always, which would be buy it and use it globally, roll it out globally? Is it um, something that we would consider to do ex US? And then a third option is it was it right for any few regions? And Jules Borkent, who was on the uh, animation panel this morning, is the guru of all of that and um, is responsible for running and considering every single property that we have. So it runs through a specific process that we have in place, which I won't get into here. Um, where you pitch it in, we look at it, we consider it, we give feedback on what what, we, what our needs are with respect to the property. And that's not just a sheer acquisition. On a, on a pre-buy or something that would be an original production development uh, consideration, it's a slightly different um, process because the asks are usually bigger in terms of the budget. Uh, from a producer's point of view, the UK system works uh, works pretty well. We have very much direct access to the broadcasters. The BBC are fantastically open. They have several executives that work for the controllers. Uh, we can approach them direct, and they have a very good acquisitions team, uh, both in the preschool and uh, in the older group. ITV does some commissioning. That's very good. And then we tend to deal uh, with the international channels, either by from their, uh, their international um, representatives in each of the country, and with Nina here, and with Jules at uh, Nickelodeon. Um, uh, so producers have to pretty much direct access. Obviously, there are loads of producers that want direct access, so it might not be immediate, but it's a pretty good system that you are emailing or phoning, going in and pitching or presenting. It's then a pretty long, drawn-out process from there on in, but at least you can get the contact fairly early. Yeah, I've never really noticed... <laughs> I really do so, much, so much research. It takes so much time, <laughs> darling. Sorry. <laughs> just to Not just to have the meeting, you know. <laughs> um, I've never really noticed much of a difference territory to territory at all in terms of, you know, at least from the producer's point of view, uh, of approaching. Once you get in, um, and if they want to show how they do deals and blah, 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 it's different everywhere. And even the process, if you're dealing with public broadcasters like the ABC in Australia, I mean, or the BBC, they are, you know, they answer to the government, and there's lots of processes. So what's the main difference there? It, length of time. Some things just take a long time when you have to go through layers, and some things, you know, we did the Disney Channel deal in a month, you know, less. Well, <laughs> so to be fair, Disney can be also very long, and to be fair, be, the public broadcaster can, can be also very long. <laughs> I also work for, the We're never long. I work for the <laughs> I work for the EBU Kids Group. I don't know if Anna is here, but uh, we can be very, very good and very quick. If they want something, the yeah, public broadcasters. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So, any other question? Um, because we've got another seven minutes, but we can also go to the beach if you want. Or <laughs> <laughs> yes. She's a producer from Canada. That's what I heard without the mic working. Radical chic. Uh, it's not working yet. So is no a no, or I remember a sales guy saying the no is a good beginning for a yes. Yeah. Do, do you know my wife? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So Nina first, because... Uh, first. Yeah. Well, no, I don't really feel I, Have I, you said I, no to something? I, it's, I, uh, I can only answer this personally. I guess every broadcaster is different in how they work. Uh, I'm a fairly literal person. No means no. If it's... If it's no but, it's no but. Or if it's, you know, if you do this, this, and this, I'd love to take a look at it again. I think, you know, we, we do try to be quick and clear and, you know, painfully or otherwise direct because I think producer, it's, you know, it's our job to serve as producers with as much information of clearly the position um, we can so that they can go away and develop something. In, in fact, we've had that experience specifically up here, Nigel and I, where we saw something and we asked, we said no but, so there was a few tweaks. The tweaks were made and now, you know, hopefully we will be walking down to a successful project together. So it is, um, 
it's pretty straightforward if you are a straightforward person, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, I think for most people, no is no. The one thing I would, I would say is, you know, if you do make substantial changes and the door has been left open with the, the but, no but. Um, if, you are, if you do get this opportunity to go back in and you have not made second uh, substantial changes and you're basically just representing it again, you'll probably never get the butt again. You'll just get no's. Um, there's the other factor is um, success and time. Um, you know, there's a show that is now doing pretty well, I think, for Nick Jr. that was pitched to me when I was at Cartoon Network called Peppa Pig. And at the time, it was not a really big hit uh, in the UK. It was, it was okay. But they had pitched it everywhere. Nickelodeon and Disney, who were in the preschool business, passed. We were just getting into it, um, into preschool, and then we were out of it really fast. Um, but we picked it up, and then, what, six years later, it's on Nick Jr. So they had and passed. And Nick Jr. in the U.S. And Nick Jr. I think it's fair also depend on success and the development. I remember I said firm no to two things that I had on my channels then. One was a lady with two socks on her hands saying the story twice, and it was the, pi the, the pitch for the Teletubbies. Um, so <laughs> it happened, but it was some development in the meantime. And I remember uh, in Germany when I was working uh, with Nickelodeon, we all said no to something. We all thought they had much too many drugs when they're doing it, and it was uh, SpongeBob. <laughs> but we all said no. I mean, the, the non-US channels at that time said never. And, um, well, you see, they managed. I think the important point there also is it's incumbent upon producers to really do their homework. And I know we spoke about this in this morning's panel, too, but, you know, you've really got to know your broadcaster. And it's difficult for indies because they can no longer make it once and pitch it everywhere. You really have to know your network. You have to pitch to the boutique approach of what they are and what they aren't. And in the same turn, we have to be as explicit as possible about what we want and what we don't want. Um, so it works both both ways, but I think um, it helps when you know where you're where you're going and you know where even it would fit in the day part. I think that was one of the main things in this morning. You don't pitch the same show in the same way to the different guys. I mean, to Cartoon Network, Disney, and Nick, it's not exactly the same kind of spirit. Same with like a public broadcaster like BBC. So it's true that these guys, when they feel like, well, they just didn't really check out <laughs> what we're doing. They say quickly, they quick, a bit quicker no. Yeah. If they feel they're not really have been addressed. Good. Or Nigel, did you I, want? I, I think uh, I never accept no. <laughs> <laughs> never accept it. Um, uh, you kind of know if you're following, if you're chasing the wrong show. I, I think bespoke it. You've got to know the network you're talking to. The network's got to believe you didn't just pull this out of a can, you know, and you're just. And uh, if you really believe in the show. Go back, but go back with it slightly different. Learn from your first meeting, but never accept now. <laughs> so, what are you looking for during this market? What are you like specifically looking at for um, live action? For us, for the most part, it is um, a live action in the ethos of the Nick Channel. So, the sort of eight to twelve comedy, multicam uh, live action work that fits in with the rest of the network. The little independent producers. Uh, 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 it's, a bit it's a bit too cliche just to say great ideas because I don't really mind whether they're in animation or live action. Uh, clearly, I think the entertainment format is going to get bigger. I'd love to find a new hub show where you can genuinely put it in a great location. Uh, we have a couple in-house, but it'd be nice to find something else. And a new comedy. I mean, I think comedy that we can, that we can take from uh, the Europe and make it work in the US. That is the holy grail. Uh, I am here looking for international broadcasters to buy my shows <laughs> that I've already made. <laughs> but you don't. <laughs> yes, you don't look at ideas here. You just. Do I really that don't. This, I use this more uh, as a selling time than a buying time, um, and the rest of the year is my buying time. Fair enough. So, is no other question now? Then um, my German blood is very happy because we're on time. We finished exactly at the time Read Me Them gave me. I thank you very much for being here and digesting with us. And I thank you, Nina, Amandine, Bob, and Nigel, for your bright thoughts. Thank you. <laughs>